As a young man, I roamed a great deal out in the West and the Northwest. I loved hunting and fishing and camping and horseback riding and shooting. But much to the frustration of our national folklore writers, I did not meet Bigfoot, <laughs> the great Sasquatch legend. However, I have encountered Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that I would rather wrestle a great legendary beast to the ground than go into a debate with Ms. Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> a woman of indomitable will, great courage, and vast determination. Please join me in welcoming Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> On November 5th, 1872, Susan B. Anthony committed a radical act. She walked into the town hall in the city of Rochester, New York, and cast a vote in the presidential election. She was so tickled with herself <laughs> that she had actually done it, that she wrote the following letter to her friend and fellow suffragette, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. <clears throat> My dear Mrs. Stanton, well, I've been gone and done it. Positively voted the Republican ticket straight. This a.m. at 7 o'clock and swore in my vote at that. Was registered on Friday. Then on Sunday, some 20 or 30 other women tried to register. But all save two were refused. Amy Post was rejected and she will immediately bring action for that. And the Honorable Henry R. Selden will be our counsel. He has read up on the law and all of our arguments and is satisfied that we are right. And ditto Judge Selden, his brother. So we are in for a fine agitation in Rochester on the question. <laughs> I hope this morning's telegrams will tell of many other women all over the country trying to vote. It is splendid that without any concert of action, so many should have been so moved. Unfortunately, Miss Anthony's vote is the only one recorded to have been recorded and actually counted in the state of New York. In fact, it was such a radical act that in early 1873, she was arrested for the crime of voting her trial was held on June 19th in the, uh, the Circuit Court of the United States for the Upper District of New York. During the trial, she was not allowed to speak or defend herself in any way. However, as was customary at the time, at the conclusion of the trial, she was asked, was there anything that she wanted to say? Before, so that the court might not pronounce sentence upon her. Ms. Anthony said that the question was moot. She had every right as a citizen of the United States under the United States Constitution to vote. And so she was fined $100. Putting that in perspective, that's 2,144 of today's dollars. Because she wasn't allowed to speak in her own defense at her trial, she was asked shortly thereafter to give a series of lectures. And the speech which she gave became the rallying cry for the suffragette movement throughout the United States. It came to the attention of Senator Aaron Sargent of California, who introduced in 1878 the bill which would eventually become the 19th Amendment. It took a little longer than Ms. Anthony had anticipated. In fact, upon her death in 1906, the best she could say was, 
well, some progress has been made. <laughs> but this speech remains the argument regarding women's right to vote. Friends and fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election without having a lawful right to vote. It shall be my work this evening to prove to you that in thus voting, I not only committed no crime, but instead simply exercised my citizens' rights guaranteed to me and all United States citizens by the national constitution beyond the power of any state to deny. The preamble of the federal constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, <laughs> nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people, who formed the Union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people women as well as men. And it is a downright mockery to talk to women about enjoying the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, the ballot. For any state to make sex a qualification that must ever result in the disenfranchisement of one half of the people is to pass a bill of attainder, an ex post facto law, and is therefore a violation of the supreme law of the land. By it, the blessings of liberty are forever withheld from women and their female posterity. To them, this government has no just powers. It is not a democracy. It is not a republic. It is an odious aristocracy, a hateful oligarchy of sex, the most hateful aristocracy ever established on the face of the globe, an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of race, where the Saxon rules the African, or even an oligarchy of the educated, where the educated rule the uneducated, might be endured. But this oligarchy of sex, which makes fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons, the oligarchs over mothers and sisters, the wife and daughters of every household, which ordains all men's sovereigns and all women's suf subjects, carries dissension, discord, and rebellion into every home of the nation. Webster, Worcester, and Bouvier all define a citizen to be a person in the United States, entitled to vote and hold office. The only question left to be settled now is, are women persons? <laughs> and I hardly believe that any of our opponents will have the hardihood to say that they are not. Being persons, then, women are citizens. And no state has a right to make any law or enforce any old law that shall abridge their privileges or immunity. Hence, 
every discrimination against women in the constitutions and laws of the several states is today null and void. What great courage. I must share a little small anecdote before we move along about Ms. Anthony. I happened to be in the White House when she celebrated her 86th birthday. I had occasion to send a greeting to her and wish her a fond happy birthday. My messenger came back and shared with me that she received it. And at a celebration that evening, she even made notice of it. She said, it's always nice to receive warm sentiments from the highest level in our government. I just wish they would do something. 